God gets really sick of people. God had just made people. And then God gets really sick of people, and then God decides we're going to wipe out the whole mess of it. And it's actually an undoing of creation. The 40 years of flooding, 40 days of flooding, excuse me, the 40 days of flooding is really an opening of the heavens and the earth and an undoing of the chaotic floodwaters from Genesis 1. So going back to to pre-creation, wiping out everybody, and then it says remarkably as the boat's floating along on the river or on the ocean, it says, "Ah, God changed his mind. What? And then God makes a covenant with Noah that says, I am going to love these, I'm paraphrasing, I'm going to love these rotten people no matter what they do. Which was a big change because he was pretty much not going to love rotten people before that. So God says, I'm going to love you rotten people regardless of what you do forever. And I'm never going to undo creation again. That's the Noachic covenant. Then a little bit later, God um, reveals God's self to Abraham and Sarai, or Abram and Sarai, they become Abraham and Sarah. And God makes a covenant with Abraham and says, I'm going to make your people as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. And of course, Sarah laughs because that's ridiculous. They don't have any kids. She's like 90-something unlikely going to have any kids. They do have a kid. But that Abrahamic covenant is the first covenant of God with a specific people, and really it's a it's kind of a family covenant with the people that later become the people Israel and later become a nation. So you have the Noachic covenant that's going to be with all people forever, no matter what, and then you have the Abraham covenant that promises that God's going to be with the people of Israel forever. And then you might remember the people come into the land of Canaan, and they have as leaders judges, but they want a king. They're feeling left out. Everybody else has a king, and we want a king. And they say, you don't want a king. They say, yes, we do. No, you don't. It's going to be horrible. Kings are a mess. But they decided they wanted a king anyway, and then you had government born. And it's been downhill ever since. But after they get a king, they get Saul as a king, their first king, and he's a complete disaster. So they get another king, and his name's David. And they make a covenant with David, which is remarkable, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the message is, in case I get lost and you're wondering, what on earth is he talking about? The covenant with David is powerful because it reminds us that God makes a covenant with pretty ordinary, broken, problematic people. Which means we have a chance. So that's the point. So I'll come back to it. Then, after the kingdom falls, so David makes the kingdom huge, and then Solomon makes it huger, and they have the biggest kingdom in the time in the world. If you look at archaeologists, will tell us that the kingdom of David and Solomon was the largest in the world at the, at a, at the time the most powerful kingdom. And like every kingdom, it's never conquered from outside. It always collapses on itself, which should trouble Americans, but just throw that out there. But the kingdom collapses because Solomon's sons are a bunch of fools, and they wreck everything. And so then they're in exile, I've just gone through a couple thousand years of history here. Are you still with me? So they're in exile, and he makes a covenant with Jeremiah, which says, you know what? I'm going to make a covenant with the people, and I'm going to write it on their hearts to know that I will be with them forever wherever they go, even if they're not in the Holy Land, even if they can't come to the temple to worship, I'm going to be with everybody forever. That's the Jeremiah covenant. Christians, of course, um, believe that Jesus is a new covenant as well, and that language of new covenant in the New Testament is very common to talk about Jesus and the promise that Jesus gives. But these covenants that God makes, this covenant that God continues to reach out, there's a couple things about each covenant that's important. One, it's initiated by God. 
it's initiated by God that God intentionally intervenes in what's going on in history and says, I'm going to be there for you. It's not ever initiated by people who are doing so much good that God says, boy, I like them. I want to be a part of that. So it's always initiated by God, and it's always done for people who don't deserve it. There's a lot of emphasis in religion these days, certainly the religion that gets a lot of popular press, that the only people who deserve God, or the only people who get God are the people who deserve God, who live in a certain way. Well, that's, there's really not a lot of evidence for that in the Old Testament, because everybody who gets a covenant with God has really fouled up. And God's for them anyway. The covenant is initiated by God. It's for people who don't deserve it. And it's transformational. So let's look at the covenant of David, which is pretty exciting. So we're going to go to 2 Samuel 7. And if you want to read all about David because you're, it's too hot to go outside this week and you're like, I don't know what to do. Open up your Bible to 1 Samuel and read chapters 16 to 24. And it's like a short story. It has a couple of chapters of stuff that doesn't make any sense, but skip past that. But 1 Samuel 16 to 24 is the whole story of David. And then if you get into Chronicles, it'll tell you the whole story again. I don't know why. So 1 Samuel, we're going to go to... I flipped my page over, excuse me. Second Samuel 7. Doo, doo, doo. Here we go. 1 to 17. Now when the king, David, had settled in his house. Now this is great. David built the parsonage before the temple. That's not usually well received. But he did. God said, I don't want a temple. I've been riding around in a tent forever. So he said, okay, I'll build a big house for me. So when, the, when David had settled into his huge house and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, David said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God's in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, and God says, and this is great, this is what I love about the Old Testament, because God just talks to people. Wouldn't that be handy? Couldn't you use a little word of actual talking? And the Lord says, tell David to forget about the big house. For me, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this very day. And I've been moving around in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders who I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now thus you shall say to my servant David, the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies, and I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones on earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more." And the evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you and shall come forth from your body, and I will establish that kingdom. Your son shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod that is mortal use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it away from Saul, who was the deadbeat king before. Your house and your kingdom, and this is the covenant of David, God's own words to Nathan, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. 
in accordance with these words. Here ends this reading. Amen. So God, David's thinking, wow, things are good. Got a lot of money. I should build a big worship house. God says, forget it. I don't need it. Build yourself a big house. That seems... That's an unusual scripture, isn't it? Don't worry about the house of the Lord. Build your own house. I think Americans have taken that to heart. Amen? <laughs> Just saying. But the covenant of David is saying, your throne is going to last forever. I'm going to bless your house. But you have to know who David was. David was picked. He was the youngest of all of his, of his brothers. He had big, handsome, strapping brothers who by all right should have been king. And when the prophet Samuel went to anoint him, they skipped past all the brothers who were ahead of him in line and picked this squirrely little kid who was out with the sheep in the pasture. So David, by birth order, should never have become king. And then he goes up against Goliath. You remember the story of David and Goliath, and he's still a boy, and there's this big giant who's going to crush him like a bug. And he ends up killing him with a slingshot. So David never should have survived into adulthood. And then David goes out and he is betrayed by everyone in his army and somehow survives. He runs and hides multiple times. And he even commits murder. He kills a man so he can steal the man's wife. What? And then the chapter before this, which is very entertaining, but there's only so much scripture you can read in one sermon. He is dancing naked before the people, celebrating the Ark of the Covenant coming up into, the, into Jerusalem. Which is inappropriate. I'm just saying, they would never pass safe and sacred training for the United Methodist Church. So here's David, who is not supposed to be king, who's running around away from his enemies, who, who, partic who is, per commits evil in killing someone to steal his wife. Here's David, who's in a lot of ways kind of a mess. And God says to him, I'm going to establish your throne forever. The good news of this is that God has a way of looking past, in fact, at the anointing, at the anointing of David. It says, God, people look at the outside, but God looks at the heart. Looks at the heart for establishing a covenant. So here's the good news. It's easy to look at our world through the television and newspaper, and I use newspaper euphemistically as you look at your computer and read the news, right? Pat, you're not reading the news on your computer? You have a paper? Bless your heart. <laughs> we do too. <laughs> It's hard, though, to look at the way the world is and not say it's as big a disaster as it's ever been, isn't it? It's, it's hard to not look at our nation um, and all the struggles and all the turmoil the last month and not say things are troubling. It's, it's hard to look at the way things are, and, and it's hard to peer into the imperfections of the people around us, and harder still to peer at the imperfections in the mirror. Yeah? And when we look at the world as broken as it is, and we look at, at the community as broken as it is, and we look at the struggles in the church, and we look at our own fallibility, there's something powerful about the Old Testament covenants that says, you know, these people are a big mess, and I'm going to love them anyway. The United States is a big mess right now, and I'm going to love it anyway. Our community, boy, looks like a big mess, and so I'm going to love it anyway. You know what? You're a big mess. And I'm a big mess. 
And somehow, for some reason, God looks at each of us and says, I'm going to love you anyway. In fact, I'm going to establish a covenant with you. I'm going to pour out my grace for you. I'm not going to give you what's left over because I'm giving all the good stuff to the good people. I'm going to give you my very best. And that fifth covenant in the New Testament that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Not because the world was working and clicking on all cylinders, but he loved the world and had pity upon it and compassion and poured out his covenant upon us. Friends, when we look at the challenges we face each and every day, and we do, and it's easy to wonder where on earth is this mess headed. Do you ever ask yourself that? I'll tell you where it's headed. It's headed directly into the arms of God, who has made a promise for thousands of years with every group of people repeatedly reaching out to them as a group, as a nation, individually, and said, I love you, and I'm going to make my covenant with you, and I'm going to walk with you. That covenant that God made with David, who really maybe didn't deserve it, is good news for all of us, for the covenant who makes with God, so we can, that God makes with us, so we can stop coming in and praying to be somehow worthy of God's blessing. I think a, a more hopeful prayer might to be to pray to receive God's blessing anyway. Because I believe when we receive God's blessing, remember the third part? It's God's initiation. It's for people who don't deserve it. And it's transformative. When we open our hearts and receive that covenant that God has given from generation to generation, and we receive it for ourselves, and we receive that transformation that God gives us, it gives us a foundation to stand no matter what we face, whether it's in the newspaper or in the mirror. That foundation of God, that covenant of God, is from everlasting to everlasting. It's for you and it's for me. And it's for all of us. That, brothers and sisters, is very good news. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for the covenants that you have given to your people throughout time. Lord, we thank you for offering that same covenant to us today. That same promise, that same confidence, that same assurance that no matter what, even when we make bad decisions, you're going to be with us. Even when things happen to us that we did not choose or want, you are going to be with us. But no matter what happens in our country or in our community, you are going to be with us. Lord, help us to receive that covenant of love today, that as we go forth from this place, we might share the good news with others. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.